we come together as people that are facing climate genocide. Today is Saturday, December the 12th, what the international climate justice movement refers to as D12, a big day of protests at the end of the COP21 for them to show their discontent with that whatever world leaders agree on today, they don't think it's going to be enough to prevent a climate catastrophe. Interestingly, today, the ban on protests that was implemented during the state of emergency in France after the November 13th Paris terror attacks has been lifted. So we're going to speak to a spokesperson for the police to ask why. Alors pour plusieurs raisons. D'abord parce qu'on était à deux semaines des attentats, qu'on était encore dans le temps de l'enquête et des levées de doute sur la possibilité d'autres équipes terroristes d'être encore présentes sur, sur Paris. On avait parallèlement l'arrivée de 150 chefs d'État et de gouvernement qui venaient participer à l'ouverture de la conférence. Depuis, euh, la période a évolué. On est à quatre semaines des, des attentats. On mobilisation de la, de la société civile pour la réussite de cette conférence est importante. A lot of climate justice protesters felt particularly targeted under the state of emergency because uh, while Christmas markets and football matches and things like that were allowed, uh, they were not allowed to make actions or protests and there were raids at activist squads, people were put under house arrests. Um, do you understand why they felt frustrated? L'État ne se place pas dans la compréhension de la frustration. Le devoir de l'État, c'est d'assurer la sécurité des personnes. Avenue de la Grande Armée, where the big red lines action has just started. 10,000 people are expected to be here, and they chose uh, to stand on this avenue to form a two kilometer long human chain. Why are you here today forming a red line? One of the things we have said is there are red lines about the climate we must not cross. The red lines, for example, is 1.5 degrees. If the world heats up beyond that point, many, many communities, especially the islands and people, coastal people and communities, will suffer severely. <laughs> today, indigenous peoples are standing as the red line of defense to protect life because their islands are literally sinking into the ocean. We come together as people that are facing climate genocide. I came all the way from Alaska to speak for my grandchild and my great-grandchildren that they will have a life like we do. Like, a bit younger, a bit of a rebel. I used to shout, fuck the system, and like, police and stuff. But now I've come to realise the system's already fucked. We need to unfuck it, we need to change it. The announcement for the COP21 agreement is going to come. Do you have any hopes for this? Well, we, we think it's not going to be good enough. I'm just looking at it now. It says maybe they put 1.5 into the text. Maybe they haven't, but we need actions more than words. We are unstoppable! Another world is possible! The protest has moved to the Eiffel Tower now and it's peaceful which is a big difference to the last protest that was held on the 29th where that ended up with arrests, clashes with the police. At the Bourget where the UN COP21 climate talks are happening, the final draft will soon be announced but world leaders are already coming out and saying that this will be a historical moment, an end to the fossil fuel era. So we're at the end of the two weeks of the COP21. Do you feel like this is a victory? Are you happy? Well, my sense is that there's really two key questions in climate politics. Massive emissions reductions and massive climate financing from the north to the south. Are there any binding commitments about emissions reductions and climate financing in the deal? No, they are not. This deal is basically a memo from the summit to the world, you know what? Never mind, we're not going to take care of this problem. So no, it's not a victory. Why is there such a sort of 
different <laughs> tone in the messages from what the media is saying, what you're saying. We had so many problems trying to organize a legal demonstration on the 12th because they didn't want any critical voices to be heard at that moment because they knew they had to do this massive operation of you know, communication around you know, the, the big achievement that summit is supposed to be. And what you see is that people are not being fooled. The direction we want to take now is we have to be behind every dirty project, every policy that is completely contradictory to what, to what they've said they wanted to do. We will be there, as Juliet said, wherever they are running their dirty project, we will be, we will shut them down. They're not going to do it for us, we'll have to do it ourselves. They just rolled out a hundred meter long banner with a red line and inside it it says, it's up to us, keep it in the ground. And what they mean is it's up to the people on the planet to make sure that no more fossil fuels are extracted. We're at Le Bourget outside the entrance of the UN climate talks. It's really peaceful and quiet, but inside it must be really intense because the COP21 negotiations are at their very final stages now. For the first time, all nations are supposed to commit to a cut on emissions. Um, to find out why it's taking so long and what's going on inside, we're going to meet a woman called Monica Araya. She's here as an observer as, and has in the past been a key negotiator for Costa Rica at these talks. So what's the atmosphere inside? The atmosphere inside is a combination of expectation, tension, but also, I think there is a feeling that something is being born. I see in the text so much that would have been unthinkable a few years back. Not because the agreement is perfect, but because it has the elements that we need to make progress. We are witnessing something very empowering because a lot of the very specific gains in the text came from the little guys, from the small islands and the vulnerable countries. And frankly, I did not expect that to happen. They are winning the hearts and minds. I think the work of civil society around them, supporting them, has been amazing because it made it impossible for the big guys to be against them. This deal is being called a historical moment. Uh, that it will be, it marks the end of the fossil fuel era. Um, how much of this is real commitment in terms of something legally binding and how much of it is just a nice aspiration? I don't think this working out on the basis of the legally bindingness of the agreement but on the basis of political accountability because now we know what the politicians came here to say. We know that 186 plans are on the table and it is our jobs as citizens to say, this is the opportunity of our generation and this is the time where we're going to have to get engaged and build movements of citizens, support renewable energy, read uh, alternative theories of change and economics so that we're part of the solution. I don't think we should be waiting for governments to solve this alone. So in other words, this is only the beginning. Exactly, but it's an exciting beginning.